weeks ago, I was speaking to a, a, a group of ladies, and uh, the lady who introduced me said, uh, well, I have some good news for you girls. I thought we were going to have to raise the dues, but we've been able to get a series of cheap speakers, so we're all right. <laughs> I'll bring you Margie Holt. <laughs> well, it is a great pleasure to be here with you in this beautiful spot tonight. I know it'd be a lot more fun to look out the window than to listen to uh, discussion of foreign policy today. But it is a subject, I think, of uh, special interest to me and I'm sure to you. Uh, from the, my position on the House Armed Services Committee, I uh, deal with it every day. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the threat as I see it, and uh, uh, some of the trouble spots. As I started uh, preparing this, I made a little list of all the things I wanted to talk about. And if I'd gone into all of them, I'd be here for two or three hours, but they told me I couldn't do that. So we'll touch on some of them briefly. And I think that we have to start with the Soviet Union. As you look at the Soviet Union today, I'm reminded of the, the schoolyard bully who, through his strength and uh, attempts to terrorize his classmates with his brute force uh, simply because he's unable to match their intellectual quickness and their creativity. The Soviet rulers have built the uh, largest military machine ever seen anywhere. And they, they're very ruthless in their oppression of their subjects. They struggle to keep the captive nations under control. They, are financing surrogate armies around the world. They're waging wars of aggression. Uh, They're supporting terrorist bands to destabilize societies beyond the reach of their military forces. But yet, I feel very strongly that they have lost the ideological war. I think communism as an ideological force has been thoroughly discredited by the Soviet experience. If we take a look at it, I think we'll, we'll see that. The Soviet economy is in a shambles. It seems to get worse with every passing year. It's a stagnant economy depressed by a sterile and rigid ideology that really suffocates the human spirit, the, the people that exist there. And I think the world is seeing that today. They are seeing that the common experience of all people under communist rule is, is common poverty and brutal oppression. Uh, in the Kremlin, we see old and fearful men representing an ideology that I feel is dead, looking abroad at a world that is far better than the one they rule, but they're worried by every small omen. Watch them. Watch the reactions that they make. Uh, every little omen that the spirit of freedom might be uh, infecting their empire. They control it constantly. When President Reagan uh, recently addressed the graduating class at the University of Notre Dame, he said, the West will not contain communism, it will transcend communism. We will not bother to denounce it, we'll dismiss it as a sad, bizarre chapter of human history whose last pages are even now being written. And he referred to that again today in his press conference. I heard him uh, repeat that, so uh, he does feel strongly about it. However, he was speaking of the communist ideology. He was not speaking of that vast uh, Soviet war machine, which I feel we cannot, we must not dismiss. The Soviet Union is probably more dangerous today than at any time since uh, its revolution more than 62 years ago. Their economy is creaking under the strain of maintaining and extending the empire, and the empire itself is beginning to crack. If you look at Poland, on the very border of the Soviet Union, in Poland where communist rule could never conquer the powerful blend of nationalism and Catholic faith, we've recently seen the National Labor Union Solidarity emerge as a, a major political force. Uh, the Communist Party of Poland has been shaken and is attempting to reform in response to uh, that mass movement that we've seen there. And the eyes of the people of Poland are not turned to Moscow for spiritual leadership. They're turning to Rome. Their eyes do not turn to the Communist Party to represent the workers. They are turning to the free labor movement. And so we see that little crack there in that empire. 
There's no question but that the Soviet armies could overrun Poland, that they could uh, crush them, but, but not without a very, very high cost, much higher than the cost of subduing Hungary or Czechoslovakia in previous years. The Kremlin leadership must be fearful of the spread of this thing that we're seeing happening there in the Polish uh, reforms, uh, in other captive nations that it controls in Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, perhaps even across the Soviet border. Uh, we've seen some signs of that in the Soviet Union. The suppressed nationalities are struggling to retain their identities, to keep their languages, to uh, to maintain their religions, those things that are important to them. Um, I had the opportunity to visit the Soviet Union a few years ago and um, meet with some of the people who are trying to preserve their, their religions, the, the refuseniks who are try, attempting to be allowed to leave that country, um, the members of the churches, old, old people who are allowed to hang on to that religion uh, simply until they die off. There can be no education of the children. The Soviet leaders have huge costs on their hands as they attempt to do these things. They have a colossal military machine to support right there in their own country, including the divisions deployed in the continuing ugly war to conquer Afghanistan. If we count the other costs of imperial ambition on a global scale, we have to take a look at Cuba, the training and armaments base of Marxist guerrilla forces in Latin America. It's an economic ruin that could not survive without infusions of billions of dollars annually from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union finances and arms 40,000 Cuban troops in Africa, they're in Ethiopia and Angola, to prop, prop up the Marxist regimes and support efforts to overthrow other regimes. <coughs> In Southeast Asia, we're seeing a tremendous buildup there. The Soviet Union is bankrolling and arming the North Vietnamese in their wars of conquest against neighboring countries. Uh, right there in uh, Cameron Bay, in our former naval base, they're building up uh, a deployment of Soviet warships. And you all know the, the situation in North Africa where Libya marches to the Soviet drumbeat, threatens its neighbors and trains and arms, terrorist cadres for activities far from its borders. Libya is certainly a Soviet arms depot. And it's Soviet arms that have killed Israeli soldiers in two wars, and uh, their arms that are in the hands of the PLO that kill Israeli civilians and soldiers in, in terrorist attacks continuing to this very day. You know that's a tremendous burden on their economy. And so we see that uh, their uh, the Soviet Union is experiencing the classical troubles that have afflicted all great empires in history. But we can't and mustn't allow, I feel very strongly in the 10 years that I've served on the Armed Services Committee, in the, uh, the years that I've lived, uh, the history that I've read, observed, uh, leads me to believe that we cannot allow these conjectures to deter us from the responsibility of defense of freedom. There isn't much of it left in the world today, and I think it's very important. And I have seen over and over in this 10 years that the only thing that the Soviet Union responds to is strength. This grizzly bear is a fearsome beast, uh, even when he's, when he's well and unmolested, but he is most dangerous when he is wounded and cornered. Now, I certainly don't speak for the, the new administration, for the Reagan administration. I heard some of the reporters today asking uh, Mr. Reagan why he hadn't come up with a foreign policy, why he didn't make a foreign policy speech, a statement. And uh, he said that he felt that he was um, performing his foreign policy, that he was meeting with heads of nations, that he was uh, doing the things that he intended to do. His foreign policy was taking shape. But in reading some of the briefings and uh, observing some of the activities, some of the materials that has been supplied, some of the speeches of Secretary Haig. I would say that, and, and believe me, I do not represent the administration. I'm speaking strictly from my observation. But I would think that what they are trying to do, based on the things I've seen, is to reestablish American leadership with consistent and strong assertions of our ideals. 
and to abandon the passive and, and even defeatist posture that we've had in, since the Vietnam War, uh, that attitude that we have adopted. We, we want to overcome that. We, it's the only way. We want to rebuild American military strength, uh, without which our leadership is doubted in a world alarmed at this huge Soviet military buildup. When we were there, uh, one of the members of our committee asked Marshal Agarkov, uh, okay, we've done away with the B-1 bomber. Now, what are you going to do uh, in return for our disarming in that way? He said, nobody's asked me to do anything. You did it unilaterally. Uh, we will never be in second place again. They make a, a great thing of realizing that their strength and their aggressiveness uh, uh, stands them well in this battle for freedom. I think that our existing and potential allies must be reassured by the administration. And then we can negotiate, really negotiate arms and troop reductions from a position of strength. And we can stop this uh, nuclear proliferation, but we can't do it from a position of weakness. We've never been able to the last time I have seen the Soviet Union respond to anything that this country has told them or asked them to do was when uh, President Nixon, after the Yom Kippur War, when the Israelis were beginning to move into Egypt and the Soviets were threatening to go in there to assist them, President Nixon called an alert around the world and they backed off, but they haven't done it since. When we mentioned their uh, combat brigade in Cuba, they said, back off, you know, we, we pay no attention to you at all. The third thing that I think that we're trying to do is to rebuild and expand our alliances to resist Soviet adventurism with the deterrent for force of both economic and military strength. That economic strength has got to be there. We have got to restore that. Mm -hmm. But then along with it, we have to... Uh, uh, preserve our, our manpower. We're losing manpower in our military. There are just so many areas that we have neglected in this 10 years, 15 years that we have been uh, letting it go by the board. Uh, we, we have uh, so much in the operations and maintenance area that we have to do. So many, many things. But that's the only way that our allies feel that we have the will, that we have the strength to, to help them to preserve this freedom around the world. We have to take advantage of developing countries' growing recognition that we, the West, can provide poorer nations with markets and technology, while the Soviet Union offers only bullets and bayonets. I just, I get so excited when I think about the things that we're trying to do in the economy here to, uh, to unleash our great free enterprise system. You know, it's there, strong, champing at the bit, ready to go. And we can provide the standard of living around the world that we have developed in this country. There's no reason on earth that we can't do it if we remove this tax burden, this uh, regulatory burden that we've placed on ourselves. And that we can do things for these other countries. We can lead them into um, a period of, uh, of uh, comfort, of a high standard of living. We have to restore U.S. economic strengths before we can do any of these things. That is absolutely essential, and I think that that's the, the position that the administration has taken. Let's do that first, and these other things will follow. I cannot emphasize too strongly my belief that uh, the survival of Western civilization depends on the strength of the Atlantic Alliance. I wish it were different. I wish that we could say that all we have to do is be nice and pleasant and everything's going to be all right. Secretary of State Haig said recently that the beginning of wisdom is to establish the consensus and confidence with our allies that has been missing in recent years. Uh, he emphasized <laughs> that we have the talent and the wealth among us, the allied nations, to maintain a favorable balance of power with the Soviet Union, but we must have the will and the sense of common purpose to achieve it. The dominant fact confronting NATO today is this. Free Europe is uh, no longer protected by this American nuclear umbrella, which means that NATO must develop its defenses in a manner consistent with the prospect of conventional war. For many years after the Second World War, the United States was a monopoly on the capability to 
wage thermonuclear war and render a foe incapable of mounting a counterattack. We were the only power with a first strike capability, and it was a great deterrent against anybody's aggression. Today, the situation is different. An American nuclear strike against the Soviet Union could not knock out the Soviet ability to retaliate, but would invite the, the sure destruction of the United States. And so what we have today is a balance of terror. Uh, if the Soviet army started rolling across the borders of Western Europe, uh, could the Europeans count on an American president to fire a nuclear warhead at the Soviet Union and bring Holocaust to this country? You know the answer to that, and so do I, and so do the Europeans. Detente is, uh, is not an obsolete word in Western Europe today. I was, uh, I was in the Federal Republic of Germany in December of last year, and uh, it, was, it was a shock to me to realize that, uh, that they feel that, that I'm wrong in, uh, in my concern and my feeling that there's a threat here. Uh, they they feel very strongly that uh, there there's a good chance that they can all get along and that uh, that there is no threat facing this massive Soviet military power near at hand. I guess their overwhelming concern is to reach whatever accommodation is possible, and they have a very substantial economic relationship. They're developing trade relations more and more with the East Bloc and with the Soviet Union. It's uh, Western Europe is certainly embroiled in a controversy over whether intermediate range ballistic missiles capable of hitting the Soviet Union should be stationed in Western Europe. We created a lot of that controversy by first uh, urging them to accept these weapon systems and then after they had gone through the political throes of convincing the people that it was a good idea, then our president uh, changed his mind, and so they said, well, we better go find somebody else to talk to. And we're going to have great difficulty in, uh, in, in wooing them back and making that alliance strong. An obvious response to the threat of Soviet missiles aimed at Western Europe uh, should be our alliance. But they are very, very nervous about it. They have insisted on uh, the arms control negotiations to, to deal with the problem. And I think they're right. I think that they're absolutely right. And I think that Secretary Haig agrees with them. And certainly the United States and the Soviet Union uh, negotiators will begin preliminary talks within a few weeks. Uh, but I think that the way that we negotiate, I had the privilege of serving on a panel of the Armed Services Committee that observed some of the SALT negotiations. And absolutely, there is, we gain nothing uh, when they feel that we don't have the will and the strength to, to say what we mean and mean what we say. Uh, some of the major problems confronting NATO arise from this doubts that they have about our will and our capability. Uh, when they see our troops out there in the test uh, uh, performances that they have not performing the way they should, not living up to uh, their concept of well-trained uh, military people. They wonder, why? Why does the United States of America uh, send young people over here who aren't any better trained than this? Why can they not produce uh, young people of a better caliber than these that are training here in our land? And so they really question whether we... Uh, why we even have a military. The dramatic expansion of the Soviet naval power with uh, emphasis on submarines calls into question our ability to, to reinforce and supply NATO forces in event of war. Uh, you know how our Navy has shrunk in recent years. So these are the things that give them such great concern. Uh, they wonder if we have the ammunition. They know we don't. They know we don't have the spare parts or even the manufacturing capability to fight a war for more than a few weeks. Uh, the reports on our readiness posture are not reassuring. Uh, we've had uh, testimony from General Slay, people who are very, very well versed in our industrial base, and they're deeply concerned about it. Do we have trained reserve forces sufficient to replenish manpower losses sustained in the first weeks if we ever had to have a war? You know that we don't. Our reserve strength has fallen. We've been trying to make the all-volunteer uh, military work. I'm not ready to give up on it yet, but we have done so many things 
uh, that the Gates Commission said we shouldn't do. We have reduced the pay. We have not kept up the health care. We haven't done all of those things to, to keep our military strong. Uh, most of their armies are drafted, and they wonder why. They, every time I talk with any heads of state, they wonder why we don't return to the draft if we can't do any better job. But we aren't ready to give up on it yet. I think that if we do the things that we're beginning to do now, we will see a real improvement. Finally, I think in of critical importance to our Western European allies is the question whether we could thwart, thwart a Soviet thrust uh, to the Persian Gulf, where the flow of oil is critical to the survival of Western Europe, European economies. NATO is an alliance that depends on confidence in American strength and commitment. And I really believe that the administration is devoting its highest foreign policy priority to this restoration of confidence. We're beginning the critical business of rebuilding our military strength, and especially our conventional forces. You know, these are the things that we haven't paid attention to. We've gone out with all these sophisticated weapon systems, but the basic conventional things, our people, our operation and maintenance, our trucks, our tanks, those things are the things that we've let go down the drain, but we're beginning that. I'd like to just remind you that during the period 1970 to 1980, American defense spending fell 30 percentage points behind the rate of inflation. And so we're putting that disastrous trend behind us. People say to me every day, well, you're cutting everything else and you're building up defense. But it has been neglected. It, we have let it fall so far behind while these other things were growing two, three hundred percent. So we've got a lot of catch up to do. From the standpoint of our relations with our NATO allies, the presence of Alexander Haig as Secretary of State, I think, is a great asset. Um, no matter where I go in the world, people respect him, they believe him, uh, they think he understands the problems. And so he, he really has uh, uh, their confidence. And I know certainly in Europe they, they uh, have good relations with him. They know that he's going to place a high priority on their needs and their concerns. And he has emphasized uh, the need for consultation with our allies and the formulation of a common policy. Let's, let's work together. So they do respect him and above all they believe him. That's where we've fallen down. We've lost our credibility. I guess more than any other place on earth, the Mideast remains the focus of attention for people concerned about the prospects for peace and war, and here's a place where enduring tribal hostilities dating back many centuries uh, became entangled in great power rivalry directed at the greatest oil riches in the world. If anybody can figure out a way out of this mess, I wish he'd stand up right now and tell me what to do. Uh, if you look at poor, bleeding Lebanon, once the prosperous financial center of the Mideast, now in ruins. Uh, Muslims backed by Syria and the Soviet Union are embroiled in civil war against the Christians backed by Israel, uh, which regularly bombs Palestinian bases in Lebanon uh, because the Palestinians conduct terrorist raids on Israel. Arab Iraq is engaged in war. Uh, with the Persians of Iran, the, these ancient foes, they've been at it for a long, long time. Now they're destroying each other's ports, they're the oil refineries. And Iraq is using the Soviet arms, but uh, receives help from Jordan and Saudi Arabia. It's really so deeply intertwined and so goes back so many, many years. Meanwhile, the PLO, the Syrians, the Iraqis, and the Saudis are committed to enmity with Israel. Uh, which inflames Arab hatred by its general pugnacity and settlement of Arab lands for security purposes. The reason, recent Israeli bombing raid on the Iraqi nuclear plant has been, I think, a grave setback to the prospects for any kind of settlement. But it was one that Israel considered necessary for her survival. Uh, and they have a a swift, sure approach to that nuclear non-proliferation. <laughs> they just move in there and put a stop to it. Uh, uh, it's of serious concern to me uh, as it regards the, uh, the uh, Egyptian and the Israeli relations. 
Uh, when Egyptian President Anwar Sadat kicked the Soviets out of his country several years ago, and he offered the hand of peace to Israel and cast his lot with the West, I think that was one of the greatest diplomatic setbacks in the history of the Soviet Union. Uh, we know, you and I, that uh, Egypt and Israel certainly haven't settled their differences, but that the path to lasting peace is going to be a long, tough one, uh, broken by ravines and rock slides and everything else. But I do worry that that bombing of Iraq was an earthquake <laughs> measuring at the top of the Richter scale. I had the uh, pleasure to, to meet with, uh, well, I have on several occasions with uh, Menachem Begin and President Sadat. I've been to the Mideast on three different occasions and have been privileged to confer with uh, these gentlemen. And they, they have a keen understanding of the common threat they face from uh, everywhere, regimes bristling with uh, enmity. Egypt's eastern neighbor is Libya, where dictator Muammar Gaddafi is consumed by hatred. I've heard uh, President Sadat call him a madman. Uh, he hates Egypt, he hates Israel, and he practices global terrorism as a major tool of his foreign policy. And, of course, it's a, a Soviet armaments and training center. But both Israel and Egypt see this uh, threat of Soviet tanks and guns on their borders. And that's the common threat that has been impelling them toward alliance, and American policy certainly should continue to encourage this development and assist them in, in every way possible. And, and, you know, this it really makes me feel proud that here we are trying to work to, to bring about peace between these people instead of exploiting the problems that they have, uh, trying to foment this kind of trouble. And uh, I, I hope that uh, we're going to see a continuation of this effort. But with the collapse of Iran as a regional power and with Iraq spending its strength in its extended war with Iran, Israel and Egypt are really the strongest powers in the Mideast. And they occupy a pivotal geographic position for defense of the entire region. And it's amazing how, well, even Saudi Arabia would, they'd never say this publicly, but it's my opinion in the, the meetings that I've had with the princes uh, there that they really are glad that they have this accord between Egypt and Israel. Uh, the Saudi princes are continuing to finance Egypt. They pour a lot of money in there. And I think they really feel that uh, that this is very important. I'm, I'm not even sure they weren't uh, happy about that strike against the uh, nuclear fuel in uh, Iraq the other day. But they feel that this negotiation going on here protects their flanks to the west and northwest. And they need that stability because other conditions are or cause for nervousness. Uh, they were seriously stunned by the revolution, the radical revolution in Iran and the prospects for further turbulence there. They were really embarrassed by the uh, guerrilla seizure of the great mosque at Mecca a year ago. And uh, they know that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan opens the way to the Persian Gulf. In recent days, we've seen the problems that are going on in Iran, the new internal disorders. If that country breaks into civil war, conditions could favor the ascendancy of Iran's small communist party. I feel that they've been involved in this from the very beginning, the Tudor party. Uh, now, and I think that's been the purpose of all of this disturbance right along, is to give them the opportunity to gain control there. Uh, and right across the long Iranian borders with the Soviet Union and Afghan Afghanistan are those Soviet divisions there. We've seen the briefing of where they're really dug in in Afghanistan, and they're all along the border. As they look across the Gulf, the Saudis have potential internal problems of their own, including uh, all of the thousands of workers that they have in there, the foreign workers that they've had to bring in. Uh, their Bedouin society has not... Uh, loaned itself easily to the development of the country, and that's what the princes are trying to do now, use these oil riches to develop their infrastructure, as they call it, and uh, they are bringing in all these foreign uh, workers to, uh, to, to build the uh, hospitals, to build all of the things that they want. Uh, of particular concern to them, of course, is Yemen. 
uh, a Soviet client of a potential source of subversion. But they are the world's largest and richest oil producers, and it's critically important to the economic security of the free world. And they practice the international politics of accommodation. They are more concerned with intra-regional rivalries of the Mideast than, than with any external threat. And so they're trying to accommodate other Arab regimes of all stripes. Uh, the Saudis and their smaller sister states of the Persian Gulf, Kuwait, and Oman, desperately want to avoid great power confrontation in that area. They know the West is interested in their defense because of their oil resources but they don't want to alienate the Soviet Union. They've not opened their ports to the American fleet in the Indian Ocean. Uh, they've told us that they don't want American bases on their soil or even on the soil of their sister Gulf states. On the other hand, they've invested vast sums of petrodollars in this country and the American economy, and they want to purchase arms from us. Uh, the Saudis have also contracted with American and other Western countries to design and construct their new and growing industrial base. But they are an extremely unstable corner of the world and approach every problem with great caution, even relations with the United States. They remember that experience in Iran where uh, the, uh, the, the Shah of Iran, the great American ally, was deposed by radical revolution while the United States looked the other way. And we remember that some of our important military technology fell into hostile hands after the collapse of the Shah's government. And I think that's a lesson that we should remember as we talk about uh, the proposal to sell the AWACS uh, planes and to the Saudis. I think that we shouldn't do it. I think that we should uh, control our own technology. They profess, the Saudis profess to be our friends, and, and they certainly are a moderating influence on world oil prices. Uh, the economic health of the West is important to them because of the close economic ties to the industrial and financial base of the West. But you can count on them to make whatever deals they feel are necessary for their own security. Uh, I remember talking with uh, Prince Saud once and. Uh, he was asking us about our supplying military technology and weapons. And then he said uh, that they would not hesitate to hold hands with the bear if it meant their survival. And so they don't make any bones about it. But because of their immense oil wealth, they have some leverage with poor Arab nations, and, and they can perform a moderating diplomatic role. And we've invited them to lean on Syria for a settlement of the crisis caused by their stationing of anti-aircraft missiles in southern Lebanon. Uh, they responded by asking us what we are doing to restrain Israel. Uh, so we, we have trouble. Uh, when I was a member of a subcommittee that met with, this was uh, back in 74, I believe, I met with uh, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Mrs. Mayer. We went first to uh, Italy, I mean to Israel, and then we flew over to Egypt. Uh, and this was at a time when we didn't have an ambassador there, long before we'd started any of the negotiations. But we made a great point of telling uh, Mr. Sadat that the American people were interested in dealing even-handedly uh, with the Israelis and the Arabs. And I think that was the very beginning, and so I feel so strongly that we've really got something there uh, that if we can continue to pursue it, uh, that we can uh, someday bring about at least a settlement. I think that uh, Mr. Sadat and Mr. Begin have both been great statesmen. Uh, they had the courage to achieve the bold dip diplomatic stroke of trying to bring the two countries together by visiting each other, and uh, so we have to have great respect for them. When we think about all the problems that are going on right there in the Middle East, as I said, I could go on for hours because there's so many places I would like to talk to you about. But one that always sticks in my memory is Somalia. We've just heard in the papers, read in the papers recently about this uh, devastation that's taking place there. They're continuing this extended war with Ethiopia. Now, that's an example of where real leadership could move in and try to bring peace. And instead of that, 
it's being the the turmoil is being exploited uh, to keep it keep it going. That I think we have about forty thousand Soviet troops, Cuban troops, and Soviet advisors in that Agadan area. I was in Somalia in '79, and on the day that President Siad Barre told the Soviet technicians and military personnel to leave his country, uh, the Soviets lost their naval base there at Barbara, and uh, we're involved in negotiations to uh, get them to let us use those facilities now. But President uh, Siad at that time disclosed to us a white paper that he had seen when he had this relationship with the Soviet Union, uh, showing that they ultimately had intended to achieve control of all of that uh, oil gulf, the mineral riches of Africa, and to force the capitulation of the West through that kind of of economic pressure. Of course, Angola is still a Soviet base. Uh, and then we get to our own hemisphere, Latin America. I think this is another one that I'd like to talk about a little bit. I think it's very, very important. In recent times, we've certainly become increasingly concerned about uh, what's happening there. Um, We've seen the Soviet Union penetrating Latin America, a process that started with Cuba and now uses Cuba as the base for expanding its influence through terror and revolution. Our policy for dealing with the problem must be extremely sensitive, recognizing the legitimate aspirations of, of those populations struggling to emerge from literally centuries of economic and political oppression. But at the same time, I think that we have to firmly resist the Soviet-Cuban move to exploit those conditions. Uh, through most of this century, United States policy has been to ignore Latin America when it was quiet and intervene when it was not. And in the last century, in the early days of this one, our intervention sometimes led to uh, the annexations of our neighbor's land. So. We've got these historical memories there that give us problems in Latin America. First, there's the memory of the Spanish colonial rule covering 300 years, then revolution that achieved independence without freedom, then new revolutions against successive despotic regimes that preserved the vestiges of colonialism, economic domination by European and North American interests, and occasional military interventions by European and North American powers. We're fortunate that our immediate neighbor, Mexico, has been a, a stable democracy, quote, for 50 years after a revolution early in this century committed it to the path of authentic reform. Uh, Mexico and Venezuela and other democracy are the strongest powers in Latin America because of their oil wealth and their uh, almost political stability. But because of these historical memories and the internal politics require that Mexican leaders find words and ways to demonstrate their independence from United States influence, even when this grates on us. And I'm so pleased that uh, Mr. Reagan is uh, setting the tone in his two me meetings with uh, President Portillo. I think it's very, very important that that he is trying to <clears throat> overcome that perception. There was respect for the sovereignty of our neighbor to the south. There was a willingness to consult and to listen, to understand and respond whenever possible to our neighbor's concerns. I believe that this administration will give uh, an extremely uh, high priority to our relationships with Latin America, and it's about time. The economic, political, and social development of Latin America must be shaped by the leaders of that region, and we should be ready to assist in whatever ways are possible. <clears throat> I hear criticism of the assistance that we have provided to the government of President uh, Jose Napoleon Duarte of El Salvador. I think he's a, a Christian Democrat attempting to achieve economic and political reforms in the midst of a terrible civil war. On the one side, he's fighting the communist insurgents armed by the Soviet bloc through Cuba. On the other side, he is threatened by right-wing terrorists who murder his land reform officials and citizens and, and uh, those who share his reform goals. 
So I think that we have to continue the, the economic assistance, but I also think that the military assistance that we've been giving them is very important uh, to, uh, to help him to survive. In neighboring Nicaragua, we have a classic example of how a popular revolution was exploited by this Soviet Cuban bloc. The Sandinistas triumphed against the Somoza military dictatorship, and today an estimated 5,000 Cubans are in Nicaragua to guide the development of a communist state. Uh, Non-communist reform elements that joined the revolution are being pushed aside and promised elections have been postponed indefinitely. I sure don't pretend to have any of the answers to the problems that, we, that I've discussed, and I know that much more knowledgeable experts than, than I am are exasperated as they search for these solutions. I think the crit critical question that we're facing in the world today is whether we have the will and the courage to to defend freedom. And to me that's so very, very important because there's so little of it left as you, as you travel around the world, as you visit the countries, as you see the, uh, the kind of activities that go on, the control of the people there. And, and our ideals, our vital interests are, are so very, very important in this world. I'll never forget that meeting in 79 with President uh, Siad of Somalia. He said, what's the matter with the West? Can't you see the Soviet Union weaving that web around the Persian Gulf, moving down through the African mineral-rich uh, nations right there in your own hemisphere? They're moving all over that hemisphere. They're building that naval presence in, uh, in Vietnam. Here's a man who was leading this poor, struggling country, desperately trying to defend himself against uh, the arms that were being uh, brought to bear on him, and he was appealing to us for help. So I think that it, that we cannot betray that kind of faith, that kind of uh, desire for help with a, a weakness of spirit. I think it would invite grave consequences. I know that America has a historic mission to promote freedom and justice and peace in a world afflicted with far too many predatory and power-hungry tyrants. And certainly in the 10 years that I've been in the Congress, I have fought very hard to uh, commit ourselves to restore these goals and not to forget that our own country was born in a revolution to achieve them. I think it's very, very important. Thank you. said I would answer some easy questions. <clears throat> Anybody have an easy one? Yes, sir. Well, it's certainly one that with which you are very familiar because of your connection with the Armed Services Committee. Uh, you mentioned that the Europeans are watching the relatively, what should I say, less than perfect performance of our troops in Europe on maneuvers. And you also mentioned that you're not quite ready to abandon the uh, volunteer army. Uh, my question is, what set of circumstances, short of disaster, would our legislators be moved by? In other words, do we have to wait until the worst happens before we give up this relatively unsuccessful experiment, costly experiment? Well, the reason I say that I'm not quite ready to give up on it is that uh, I feel that the Gates Commission that recommended the all-volunteer service also told us that we would have to pay comparable wages to uh, the economy, that we would have to maintain health care, that we would have to continue educational benefits, that we would have to keep the quality of life high in order to attract young people. What did we do? We cut their wages to bare bones. We got them on food stamps. Uh, we practically did away with the health care. We abolished the GI Bill for education. Uh, we have uh, not kept up the, even the homes or anything, so we really haven't done the things that we were uh, told would have to be done if we were going to make a success of it. We're moving back in that direction. We have seen some improvement in uh, recruitment and also in retention as a result of some of the pay increases that we've put into the 
to the budget. You know, we've, uh, the president is proposing a $29 billion increase, and most of that is going for manpower and for operation and maintenance. So if, if this will turn it around, if the educational benefits, if that kind of thing will make a difference, I think that it will succeed. General Bernard Rogers is strongly proposing that we have a draft for the individual ready reserve because he feels that that's our weakest point. If we ever had to mobilize, we wouldn't have the people to replace the reserves who would move in to place the, replace the active duty people. So I say that I think that, that that's the first step. Then if it doesn't work, now a year ago when the, uh, the military people, the chiefs of staff and, and the people who testified before our committee came before us, they were saying that they were opposed to a draft. This year when they came back, they said they are almost ready to go. General Rogers is the only one who really advocates it, but he's the one that's